Well, good morning, Faith family. Welcome to FBC Olo Online. I want to welcome you if you're visiting with us. Thank you for joining us this morning online. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, please, if you have any questions or uh, anything that we might could help you with, please email us at fbcolo at fbcolo.com. This morning, we're beginning a new series that we've entitled Looking to Christ in Our Crisis. Uh, we'll return to Hebrews uh, in, in May, uh, but for the next four weeks, we want to look to Christ in the midst of our crisis, look to his word uh, to give us the help that we need in these days. I'd like to invite us to enter into a time of prayer this morning. So wherever you are, in your living room, in your office, uh, with a family or, or on your own, if you would uh, get situated, if you would like to get on your knees, I don't know if you need to lay down, you may fall asleep. Unless you have kids in the room, you're probably not falling asleep. Uh, but get, get situated. We're going to uh, begin this morning in a time of prayer. In Philippians chapter 4, it says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's go to him this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts. Uh, so I'd like to invite you uh, you can pray silently where you are, or if you want to ask someone in your family, or if you yourself just want to vocalize a prayer first of thanksgiving. Let's set our minds this morning on all that we have to be thankful for. Even though there's plenty to be discouraged about, there is even way more that we have to be thankful for. So let's set our minds on on that and spend time counting our blessings. You name them to God. God, thank you for, and you fill in the blank. And then I'm going to give you time to make a prayer of supplication, to seek the Lord for your needs, make requests known to him, confess your sin, uh, confess uh, hindrances or things that are weighing you down this morning. Lay those aside at the feet of Jesus this morning. Make requests for all of our healthcare workers in our community and in our state and in our country that are laboring so hard in these days. Let's lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Those that are sick uh, and those that have lost jobs, uh, that are overwhelmed with uh, financial despair, even maybe in our own congregation, let's lift those up to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to give you time to pray, and then I'll lead us in prayer. So let's pray together this morning. Thanksgiving and supplication. Heavenly Father, your blessings truly are too many to count. Your mercies are new to us every morning, this morning. God, we know that you are near to the brokenhearted. You're near to us in our difficulties. God, we're so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful for the hope that we have, that we want to center our minds on this morning in your word, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, I do pray that uh, we would just continue to be mindful of, God, how you're working, even in the midst of these difficulties in our lives, uh, in the life of our church, and, and even in our country. God, we ask for you to continue that work. God, help us. God, our, our needs are many. Uh, Father, we are heavy this morning for so many that are sick. God, we ask for healing and uh, for those who are weary 
from working hard in the healthcare system. God, we pray that you give them grace and endurance. Help them to look to you in this time, to find strength. Uh, Father, that they would be your hands and feet and speak hope and speak life to those in need. Uh, Father, we ask this morning that you grace us with your presence, God, that as we look to your word, as we sing your word, God, inhabit our praises. Be with us. We need you. God, lift our souls. God, lift our eyes to you this morning. You are our help. You are our anchor this morning. We're looking to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In Psalm 121, it says this, I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let my foot be moved. He does not sleep. He does not slumber. We're looking to him this morning. We've been prone probably this week and in these days to see that we need help and find ourselves looking to the news for help, looking to Netflix for help, maybe looking to get outside, which can be a good thing for help, and maybe even destructive things, looking to alcohol to help us in our time of need, looking and turning into sin to cope in our time of need. But church, let's look to the hills and find our help in Jesus this morning. Let's look to him and find the true and ultimate help that we need, the anchor to our souls, our solid rock, which our feet stand on this morning in Christ Jesus. I wanna invite you to stand and we're gonna begin to sing together. Let's sing praises to God, our hope and our help uh, and our solid rock this morning. Let's sing together. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me, and my sails have all been torn in the suffering and the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be the sure and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then goes the anchor though I justly stand accused I will hold to the anchor it shall never be Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief hopeless somehow oh my soul now Lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance. See his love forever proved. All my hope is in the anchor. It shall never be the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death when these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath we will cross that great horizon clouds behind and life secure I 
He's the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand. Then darkness veils his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is seeking sand all other ground is seeking sand his oath is covenant his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is seeking sand all other ground is seeking sand shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is seeking sand all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Father, we praise you. We praise you because we have a solid rock. We have a firm foundation in Christ, our hope. We praise you. We lift your name up because of Christ, our solid rock. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. I trust that you're there <laughs> as we uh, begin uh, looking to Romans chapter 8. This morning, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25, considering Christ as our hope. Now, as we have been in the book of Hebrews during our times on Sunday mornings today, as Pastor Philip mentioned earlier, we are beginning an April sermon series specifically designed to strengthen Christians and the church in the midst of our current pandemic. And we've entitled this series, Looking to Christ in Our Crisis. 
And so during this series, we'll be considering four different passages examining different aspects of who Christ is and what Christ has done in order to give us hope, in order to give us perseverance, and in order to give us strength in the midst of life's struggles. And during this pandemic and during every season of life, both good seasons and bad seasons, Jesus is who we need to look to as our source of hope and strength, as his grace is sufficient for every need. Now, our, car- our current pandemic reminds us of the pain in this world. These things are not surprising. These things are not uncommon. Now, it may seem uncommon to us because we've not experienced something of this magnitude, but pandemics in general should be expected. Why, you may ask? Well, because of sin. You see, pandemics remind us of the sin that is in this world. Pandemics remind us of what is wrong with this world. Pandemics remind us that this world is broken. Now, if we're not careful, and as I have said several times throughout this pandemic, we can begin to think wrong thoughts about God. We can begin to think that God is not in control. We can begin to think that God does not exercise power and sovereign authority over the outbreak and spread of COVID-19. And if we're not careful, we will strip God of his all-encompassing power and declare that this pandemic is outside of his control and something of which he did not intend to happen. And while this might be our natural inclination, Romans chapter 8 tells us something about the pain of this world and God's purpose in the midst of our pain. You see, God has a purpose in our pain. This world has been infiltrated by sin, but we are not a people left without hope. The subjection of creation to futility was done for a purpose, one of which gives us comfort, one of which gives us strength, and one of which gives us peace in the midst of a pandemic. And I pray this morning that we look to Christ as our hope. I pray that we are strengthened by this hope, and I pray that we are not swayed this way or another to hopelessness or to look to something else to give us hope in the midst of this pandemic, but that we direct our gaze to Christ. Christian, this morning, be filled with hope because Christ is our only hope. And so if you would, in honor of the reading of God's Word, would you stand there in your home or your office or wherever you find yourself as we read Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. The Apostle Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing For the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Would you pray with me? Father, as we open your word this morning together, a unified body spread across various locations. As we do this, we thank you that you are not confined by four walls, 
We thank you that you are omnipresent in the homes, in the offices, wherever your congregation is spread out. You are ever-present in all of these locations. And so, God, as we do look to your word and as we consider Christ as our hope this morning, we pray that you would give us understanding. We pray that you would give us strength. We pray that you would give us peace. We pray that you would turn our eyes to gaze upon the beauty of our hope in Christ as he is our only hope in the midst of a sin-stricken world. And God, be glorified this morning through the preaching of your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we begin this text this morning, Romans 8 is one of the most hope-filled passages in all of Scripture. The Apostle Paul, through this letter, boldly declares that for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now, now, in this moment, no condemnation. And that means the wrath of God is not nor ever will be directed toward those who love and follow Jesus. And those on whom no condemnation rests are those who walk in the Spirit, trusting and seeking God, heirs with Christ of the great heavenly inheritance awaiting them. But this inheritance does not come easy. You see, Paul reminds us in the previous verses leading up to 18, the only way this inheritance is obtained is through suffering. Look at it, 16 and 17. It says this, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. However, while we suffer with Christ in this life, the suffering of Christians is not purposeless. You see, Paul instructs his readers on how to endure suffering by recognizing it for what it is and then looking past the suffering in this world to the future glory that awaits them. And when we consider the inheritance being guarded by God for us in the heavenly places, as 1 Peter 1 tells us, the sufferings of this world will certainly fade away or be minimized. And so with this being said, this is where we pick up in this letter in verse 18 of chapter 8. And so the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that current suffering equals temporary pain. Current suffering equals temporary pain. We see this in 18 through the first part of 20. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now, Paul opens this section by recognizing the reality of suffering in this world as compared to the future glory that awaits all of those who trust in Christ for salvation. And so, as Paul draws attention to suffering as compared to future glory, we need to realize and understand very quickly that Paul is not minimizing suffering. Paul is not minimizing suffering by saying the sufferings of this present time are just not worth comparing to the future glory. He's not saying that they are, that they are, they are not real or that they're non-existent or anything of that nature. And so when we say temporary pain or I say temporary pain, neither the Apostle Paul nor I are minimizing the reality of true pain and suffering in this life. You see, suffering is real. Pain is real. Suffering is difficult. If anybody knows about earthly suffering, it is the Apostle Paul. Paul is very familiar with pain and suffering, probably much more so than many of us. Hear this from 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four through 28. Paul writes, Five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. That means he's been whipped five times. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers. Danger from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul knows the reality of suffering and the reality of pain. And Paul does not discount this reality. You see... Many are feeling the painful effects of this pandemic to a large degree. Sickness, death, separation. Many of the elderly unable to see loved ones. Isolation, finances, failing businesses, etc. And on and on it goes. And all of this is real pain that we feel. It's real. But Paul says that this pain, this earthly pain, though real and as real as it gets, is only temporary. Not only that, but the pain that we as Christians feel is nothing to be compared to what awaits us. You see, if you are in Christ, you can walk through pain. You can walk through heartache. You can walk through anxiety. You can walk through chaos. You can walk through uncertainty. And you can walk through pandemics knowing that the glory waiting to be revealed to us after this earthly life far outweighs the hardship of this world. The glory that awaits us is not even on the same scale as our temporary pain in this life. Words cannot begin to accurately describe this glory. Not only that, but all of creation longs to see this glory revealed to the sons of God. The anticipation is building. The longing of creation is building. The glory to be revealed is beyond anything ever seen this side of heaven. But pain is still real because pain is a part of a fallen creation. As God's people, we must recognize that there is purpose in pain. Primarily, because of him who subjected creation to futility. You see, this is where we can deviate from biblical truth if we're not careful. You see, on one side, some may say that God does not want certain things to happen or God is seemingly out of control of certain things or certain events. Yet on the other side, we may be tempted to think that God is the direct cause of all evil as some sort of sadist who takes pleasure in afflicting pain. And so understanding the purpose of God in pain and his relationship to our suffering and to the fallen creation is very important, especially in times like this. You see, the first part of verse 20 tells us that creation was subjected to futility. Futility is a word that we may or may not use on a regular basis. My guess would be that most of us do not use this word. But here... Paul uses this word to communicate the idea that all of creation has been subjected to sinfulness, to uselessness, or hopelessness. And what Paul is doing here is pointing back to Genesis chapter 3 in what we refer to as the fall of man. When our parents, Adam and Eve, rejected God's commands and sin entered the world. And not only did it affect humanity, but all of creation was marred by sin, Paul tells us in Romans 8. This is why we have death. This is why we have sickness. This is why we have pandemics. This is why we have natural disasters, and on and on and on it goes. All of creation, from the single blade of grass to the magnificent stars in the sky, feel the effects of sin. 
But we can't miss what Paul is saying here because it develops a sound biblical theology of suffering and the sovereign goodness of God in our suffering. You see, who subjected creation to futility? He says it was God. It was God that subjected creation to futility. And so when we're tempted to think that the pain, difficulty, and seeming chaos in this sinful world is out of God's control, consider Romans 8 and the reality that God is the one who subjected all of creation to futility. This is an elaboration on Genesis chapter 3. And this subjection of God's is his judgment on sin. Creation was subjected to futility because of the sinfulness of humanity. This is the painful childbirth bestowed upon Eve in Genesis chapter 3. This is the thorns and thistles that Adam encounters in his work. This is the vanity of which Solomon speaks of in Ecclesiastes. The futility of this world. But listen, the original creation did not begin in futility. These are all things that were foreign to the original design when God rested and said it was good. However, because of the fall of man, God subjected all of creation to futility of which we know so well today. You don't believe that, turn on the news. It is the judgment of God on sin. But listen, do not miss this. Do not miss this. He did not subject creation to futility blindly. He did not do this just for the sake of doing it. God does not do purposeless things. God is ordered and God is purposed in everything he does, even in subjecting creation to futility as a judgment on sin. And this brings us to the next point I want to make from this chapter. As Christians, we suffer with hope. Christians suffer with hope. Look at the second part of 20, verse 20. Actually, just two words left in verse 20. So God, for creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Key words, in hope. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now let's key in on this word hope for just a second. Creation was subjected to futility right on the heels of that and cannot be separated in hope. 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 Paul says that creation is subjected to futility in a hope that is not wishful thinking. You see, this hope is not wishful thinking. This hope is not the same type of hope that you and I would say, well, I sure hope this happens. It's not that type of hope. Paul is not saying that God subjected creation to futility in hopes that something would happen in order to restore it. In hopes that someone would just pick up the pieces and clean up the mess as if he doesn't know if that's going to happen or not. I just said that God has a sovereign purpose in all that happens. And this is the case with the judgment passed down because of sin. In hope. You see, the plan of redemption through Christ was not plan B. The plan of redemption through Christ was plan A that was predestined before the foundation of the world. Acts chapter 2, 22 and 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan, definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and you killed by the hands of lawless men. 
Now, while we can go to the depths with this verse, well, to the depths with verses such as this, my purpose in pointing to the definite plan of God in the crucifixion is to draw your attention to the definitive hope that we have in Christ. Our hope, the hope Paul is writing about here, is a sure and certain hope, not wishful thinking. And so God subjected creation to futility in a sure and certain hope that is the the definitive, definite, predestined plan of God that Christ would come and redeem his people. And so God subjected creation to futility in the sure and certain hope that creation will be set free from bond, the bondage of corruption, which he says, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 21 says, the divine intention of creation was renewal, not corruption. It was subjected to futility because of sin yet in hope that the whole creation would be liberated from sin. God will one day set the world free from decay. You know what this means, Christian? This means that COVID-19 cannot destroy our hope. This means that Christ is our hope and nothing can destroy Christ, the one who defeated sin and death. This means that good health is not our hope, but Christ is our hope. This means that the stock market and our retirement is not our hope, but that Christ is our hope. This means that the government bailout is not our hope, but Christ is our hope. This means that a Republican or Democratic president is not our hope, but that Christ is our hope. Creation will continue to feel the effects of sin, but we, the people of God, rejoice in our sufferings because we know that we have been set free from the bondage of sin and death, and we have obtained freedom from these things as the children of God. Now, we may feel their effects now, this side of heaven, but these effects are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. But the good thing about this, even in our suffering, even in our isolation now, social distancing, we're not on our own. Even in our suffering, we are united together as a part of creation. Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation, the whole creation, the whole creation, Creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Christian, you're not suffering on your own. You see, all of creation, get this, all of creation, both unbeliever and believer alike, have something in common. That is suffering. The unbeliever suffers. The believer suffers. Whether we are in Christ or not, we all suffer in this world, and we're unified in our suffering. This is why in the midst of of, of pandemics, it's not hard for us to draw together with our neighbor, to sympathize with our community, because all of us, believer and unbeliever, feel the effects of sin and suffering. You and I feel the birth pain. We know that life is pain. We groan in so many ways in this fallen world. We groan because we grieve. We grieve over our sin. We grieve over death. We grieve over the troubles in this life. But here's the difference in all of creation, believers and unbelievers. Here's the difference for believers. This is what separates the Christian from the rest of the world when it comes to pain and suffering. Look at verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We have hope in our suffering. Separates us from everyone else. The Christian's grief is an expectant grief. We grieve, but we anticipate We expect the resurrection of our bodies. You see, that is a grief that looks forward to a time when all that is causing pain will be removed and salvation will be consummated. 
Christian groaning is a joyful grief that gives birth to a sure hope and a patient endurance. Because we have the Spirit, we groan, we live frustrated in a sense because our salvation, though real, is not yet consummated at the return of Christ. And this leads us to proclaim, come Lord Jesus. Let your groanings and grief during this pandemic draw you to Christ. Now I've been saying this to myself And I've said it to several people in the midst of this pandemic. People are longing for hope right now. People are longing for a word of hope. You see, right now when you turn on the news, when you turn on social media, when you go to any other source for news, whatever the case may be, all you get is the chilling reality that there is a global pandemic that is causing suffering upon suffering to so many people in so many ways. And in the midst of a culture that is inundated with bad news and tragedy right now, everyone is longing for a word of hope. Your unbelieving neighbor is looking for a word of hope. Your coworker is looking for a word of hope. Your family member is looking for a word of hope. People are starving for a word of hope during this pandemic, and the people of God have that word. The people of God have an opportunity, even in the midst of social distancing, to be the voice of hope to a culture that needs a word of hope. We have way more outlets to communicate with people now than we ever have before. And we can either be a people governed by fear and governed by hopelessness, or we can be a people spreading a message of hope in the midst of this pandemic. Are you using this pandemic to continually breed an environment of hopelessness and despair? Or are you using your platform to point people to the only hope in the midst of a situation like this and the only hope in the midst of any crisis or tragedy, which is Jesus Christ? Church, we have a mission. And we have people in our lives who need to hear this hope. They need to hear that this is going to be okay. And there's only way, one way, to give us peace and comfort in the midst midst of this pandemic, and that is Christ. You see, you don't have to be face-to-face to to share this message. But people need a word of hope in the midst of this crisis, and we can give that to them. And that is Jesus. Christ is our hope. Sin has entered the world, but we have overcome sin and death through Jesus Christ. We need to hear, and people need to hear this message today, and people need to hear this message tomorrow, and people need to hear this message for the rest of their lives, that Christ is our hope. And what makes our hope sure and certain is the content of our hope. Look at 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. You see, the specific content of our hope is the return of Christ, together with the things that we've read in these verses, the resurrection of the body, the adoption of God's children, and the gathering of God's harvest. And these things are all promised to us by God promised. God doesn't break promises because God is perfect. He can't break break promises. And so the Christian hope, the Christian's hope is a confident hope. And the Christian hopes in confidence, a confidence grounded not in the strength of one's emotional outlook, not in the strength of one's emotional outlook on the things of this world, but on the sure word of God which cannot lie. If God says these things are coming, it is reasonable and safe for us to hope confidently in these things. And so what do we do, Christian? Christ is our hope. Christ is our hope. What do we do in the midst of tragedy? What do we do in the midst of crisis? What do we do in the midst of pandemic? We wait patiently. We wait patiently. You see, hope means awaiting something we do not see. 
We have a promised inheritance being guarded by Christ in heaven. But we don't see it. We can't touch it. We can't smell it. But we will. Our hope is founded upon the nature of God himself who made this promise to us in Christ Jesus. And it's important for us to know that biblical patience is not passivity. We don't just sit back and wait for God to bring these things about. This is an active, patient waiting. It expresses itself in vigorous service for Christ even while we wait for his appearing. Even while we're isolated, we serve Christ. It is what Paul has been describing regarding a person of the Spirit. We have hope in the midst of suffering as we patiently wait what God has promised to us. Now, if you do not follow Christ, you do not have this hope. If you do not follow Christ, you do not have the confidence, this confidence in the midst of suffering. The suffering that you will experience after this world will be far greater than the suffering you experience in this world. But you can have this hope. In the midst of this pandemic, you can have hope. You can have peace. And you can have comfort. And that only comes through the Prince of Peace. You see, as we've mentioned, God is holy, God is perfect, God is righteous, God is everything that you and I are not. And because Adam and Eve rebelled against God, the first humans, sin entered the world and all of creation has been subjected to futility. We are all unified in our suffering. We feel the pains of sin. And our sin is an offense against a holy and righteous God. And because of our sinfulness, the wrath of God rests upon us. But God sent Jesus Christ to live a perfectly holy life. His Son, the eternal Son of God. Jesus was crucified, murdered, nailed to a cross, shedding His blood and sacrificing His body on behalf of those who would repent, turn from their sin, and trust in Him. And he says to you and I today, he says to turn from your sin and trust in him as your Savior and you will have eternal life. You will be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and the wrath of God no longer rests upon you. And that is our hope in the midst of crisis. Because as promised to those who repent and believe in Christ is an eternal inheritance, a future glory that cannot be compared to the sufferings of our present time. Church, we have hope in the midst of suffering. We have hope in the midst of a pandemic. And we have hope because Christ is our hope. And Christ does not fail. Christ does not leave His people. Christ will not forsake His people. And we are a hopeful people in the midst of suffering. Let's be a people that believe that. And let's be a people that give that hope away to others. Be a voice of hope in proclaiming that Christ is our hope. Christ is our hope in the midst of this pandemic. And Christ will always be our hope in the midst of all seasons of life. Pray with me. Father, we are extremely grateful that as we suffer in this life, to whatever degree we do, that we're not hopeless in our suffering. God, there is a strange dynamic that comes with being a Christian where we can look up even in the midst of our pain and say, blessed be the Lord. And it's something of which we cannot even begin to utter in our own strength. 
We cannot even begin to voice those words in our own power. But it's the power of Christ within us that enables us to look at a global pandemic and to confidently know that you will take care of us. And so, God, I pray that Christ would be our hope, our anchor that we hold to in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of crisis. I pray that Christ as our hope would be the message that we spread to our neighbors and our friends and our family in the midst of uncertain times and chaos. I pray that we do not turn to the things of this world for our hope, but that we trust in Christ as His grace is sufficient for all of our needs. God, use your church here at First Baptist Olo to spread this message of hope found in Christ. We're so thankful that Christ is our hope. And not some other entity, not some worldly organization, not some other person, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our only hope. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Oh, for grace to trust Him Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus Just to trust His cleansing blood Just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. It is sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him Trust him, how I proved. 
church. Uh, I hope that you've had a good Sunday as we have worshiped together through song uh, and through the preaching uh, of the word. I do want to give you a few announcements as we do depart. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, uh, which begins uh, what is referred to as Holy Week. And all leading up to Easter, next Sunday, which will look a lot different than it generally has in the past, uh, but nonetheless, we will uh, celebrate, as we do every Sunday, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, one thing we want to do as a church this week, uh, through Holy Week, is read some devotions together. Desiring God and John Piper uh, have uh, offered up freely uh, Holy Week devotions, one for each day, starting today and then going through next Sunday, uh, that you can read through. Uh, we ask if you have a family, read through it with your family, with your kids. If you're uh, married and don't have kids at home or don't have kids yet, read with your spouse. If you're single, read with you and the Holy Spirit. That's good. Uh, and, uh, and read through those things each day uh, as we will be reading through them as a church. They're short, uh, little devotions, but also, uh, even though we can't see each other physically, which we miss, we will be posting a video each day of one of our church members reading through that day devotion. And so we'll be posting that on our YouTube page where you're getting this, Facebook, wherever uh, wherever uh, we put that out there. And so you can access those devotions on our website. If you go to fbclo.com, it's right at the very top of our website. You'll see it in the red, uh, red bar up top. You can find those there, print them off, read them on your phone, however you would like. But we want everybody participating in that. Although we can't gather together physically, we can participate in that in our homes. And then uh, leading up to uh, Easter Sunday and anticipating what we'll be doing there. And so check that out. If you have any questions about that, let us know uh, on that. I do want to thank all of you who have continued to faithfully give, either through mailing in uh, your offering or giving online. We tried to set up a, a platform online that enables you to give in a much more easy way uh, uh, since we're not here together, and so uh, you can check that out on our website. Uh, students, uh, youth, keep meeting via Zoom with Pastor Philip. If you have any questions about that, uh, text him, call the church office, uh, let us know. Uh, I started last week, this past Wednesday, a live Wednesday Bible study on Wednesday afternoon. If you're unable to join us live, those things do post, and so you can find that on our YouTube page, or you can find it through uh, social media or our website. We'll continue that this week. Uh, we also want you to email Email us with prayer needs. We posted on social media uh, that we are gathering an electronic prayer guide for, for those affiliated with our church that need uh, prayer. And if you would like uh, for us to pray for you some way, uh, email the church with prayer needs, fbcolo at fbcolo.com. And uh, I also want to thank everybody for your encouraging words. <clears throat> this has been a difficult season for all of us. Uh, a difficult season uh, for your pastors and trying to pastor from a distance. It's just new. It's new stuff for us. And so many of you have, have texted us, have written us cards, uh, have called us and, and told us on the phone. Just been very encouraging to us. And I promise you that means, that means a lot to us because we often feel helpless uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and so it's definitely encouraging to us. I do want you to do another thing uh, as we uh, are, are isolated and socially uh, distance. Uh, one thing that this reminds us of is our brothers and sisters across this globe that are unable to meet freely like we are in this country. And so it reminds us of the persecuted church worldwide uh, that doesn't have the same freedoms in which we have to gather every Sunday. And one thing that's continually come to my mind as I have longed to gather is that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that, that this is their every week. They're not able to gather. They don't have the technology, nor are they able to utilize it uh, in, in order to do so. And so we're reminded that there are those across this world that do not have these freedoms. And so this week, uh, I want you to pray for the persecuted church. I want you to pray for those who uh, don't have the freedoms that we do to gather as the people of God, and yet they're persevering, and God is seeing them through, and they're finding other ways to meet in the face of danger. Uh, facing death, facing imprisonment, and a variety of other things. And so uh, this week, if you think about it, pray for the persecuted church, our brothers and sisters across this globe who do not have the same freedoms that we do. 
Again, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I want to leave you with Psalm 117. It's two verses. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Love you guys. Praying for you. See you next week via online.